Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Just so you know, we do have a Instagram now, so you can keep posted on what we are doing and what we are reading of the week or the month. Untangle Your Anxiety, Chapter 7. One of the biggest stumbling blocks in anxious recovery is the negative perspective that we view our anxiety from. As well as the way we speak to ourselves when trying to overcome it, the person who approaches tackling anxiety with an attitude of self-forgiveness, compassion, and patience will be the person who gets their life back on track again. Whereas the person who is highly self-critical, who sees anxiety as a sign of failure, then blames themselves for being anxious, will be the one wrestling with it for, the, for a little while longer. Cultivating a new, healthier attitude is very important when it comes to an anxious recovery. There's absolutely no point in challenging anxiety if you are being critical of ourselves. Josh. We know the psychoeducation side of anxiety now, so let's develop a stronger understanding of how our inner dialogue can affect things, as well as our beliefs around the success actually means. It is imperative that we do not see ourselves as victims or people who are terminally ill. But as people who are just a bit stuck in a cycle, which we can break free from when we attempt to do so correctly. We both passionately believe that everyone can break free from the nasty cycle of anxiety. The reason why being self-critical does not work is, being criti is because criticism stimulates the stress response. Think about it. If we followed you around all day from the moment you woke up and criticized you for avoiding, criticized you for being anxious, pointed out that you didn't feel yourself and happy, reminded you that you don't feel like your old self or the people around you, this would incredibly this would be incredibly stressful. The impact of us constantly reminding you and telling you that anxiety has got you and you're not how you should be would have a huge emotional impact. Now imagine the impact that would that would have if you were saying it to yourself. These critical voices not coming from two strangers, but from within your own mind. This is why perspective is hugely important. See anxiety as a spectrum, not binary. When in his practice, Josh always invites clients to rate their current anxiety on a scale from 1 to 10. This means the anxiety that their feeling is the in, in that very moment is important because anxiety always presents itself as varying levels you can be experienced low level anxiety where you feel on edge and unable to relax or you could be in a panic which you put yourself up on a higher scale wherever you are on the scale this is okay too many anxious people fall into the unhelpful thought trap of thinking anxiety is either here or not here without considering what is happening from the more accurate perspective. Sometimes we can live with low-level anxiety, whereas other times it can feel quite acute. Knowing that anxiety never remains a constant is a helpful thing to know. It really helps with recovery too. Rather than judging our recovery on whether anxiety is there or not, it helps to break it down into smaller units of measurement. For example, you may walk into a shopping mall with anxiety at a 9 on your anxiety scale. Then, on leaving, it may be a five. This is some outstanding exposure work and puts you well on the way to recovery. It also means you have successfully lowered your anxiety. Okay, so it may not be ideal or end goal, but it's a great leap in the right direction. However, self-critical people may perceive this as a failure and we find this heartbreaking. Start getting into the habit of really getting to know your anxiety levels. If you can notice that your anxiety has come down significantly or even that it increases as you get closer to a trigger, then this is a good mindful observation. It'll help you be able to detach from feelings when practicing exposure or just trying to do something whilst anxiety is present. After all, you didn't avoid doing anything if you're anxious. You're more than capable of doing anything whilst the threat response is firing off. If you can do an activity and leave it feeling less anxious, then when you began it, then you're on to a winner. Cognitive reframing. This moves us splendidly onto cognitive reframing. Cognitive reframing is when we take an original belief and we alter it in a way that means we still believe it, it but it's from a more positive perspective. 
For example, I hate that I'm going to have a panic attack at work. This could be reframed in a way that it becomes more positive, such as, work will be another chance for me to practice being anxious. Here are some examples of cognitive reframing below, and we encourage you to make your own. Original thoughts. I'm sick of overthinking everything. It doesn't get me anywhere. Cognitive reframe. I have a highly intelligent analytical brain that sometimes gets stuck in anxious loops. Original thought. Last time I went to the mall, my anxiety didn't go away. Cognitive reframe. I was brave enough to go to the mall and do everything despite feeling anxious. Original thought. I'm always making myself anxious. Cognitive reframe. At the moment, my anxious response seems to have my intention. Original thought. What if I get scared at the party and need to leave? Cognitive reframe. The party is the perfect opportunity to practice tolerating my anxiety. Original thought. I'm losing my mind and losing my control. Cognitive reframe. I feel vulnerable and can notice that I'm having the thoughts. What if I lose control or lose my mind? Original thought. I'm a burden on people at the moment. Cognitive reframe. Everyone goes through tough times in their life. This is mine. Cognitive reframing is especially important when we look at the importance of exposure, but more specifically, willful willful tolerance. This is when we are willing to go and feel anxious in any situation and the knowing and the knowledge of why we are doing it. Willful tolerance. There are many people trying to battle anxiety and who are bravely putting themselves through situations to make them scared, only for them to be scared the next time they approach the situation. For example... Someone who is scared to go too far from their home may attempt to do it, but then they feel the relief of being back at home. They successfully tolerated the trip out, but perhaps it was missing the main ingredient to recovery, that of it willingly, of doing it willingly. When we approach scary situations willingly, this primes the brain for active rewiring. Both of the anxious response for future situations and also our default behaviors and habits surrounding anxious triggers. This means we have an approach situation. This means we have to approach situations knowing that it's okay to be scared because we know we aren't in any real danger and all that we are experiencing is a very noticeable discomfort. This means we must abandon thoughts such as "Oh, I hope I don't get anxious later." With thoughts such as, okay, the next time I get anxious is the perfect time for me to practice tolerating my anxiety in order to tell my brain that this is safe. It's really important to remind ourselves that the brain actually wants to turn off the anxious response and is willing to. However, it will only do it when we show it and there is no danger. It's a bit like saying, hey, anxious brain with your scary sensations and what ifs. I know you want me to avoid and you're going to give me scary sensations scenarios and bodily sensations to convince me to avoid but i'm just going to do it anyway watch me trying to not white knuckle your way through situations is as this is the opposite to do willful tolerance examples of white knuckling include checking the clock and counting down until you can escape practically trying to distract yourself from from baiting away the thoughts getting drunk in order to get through a situation researching all the escapes beforehand and during the event, relying on another person to get you through the situation, overly relying on emotional crutches such as a mobile phone. White-knuckling behaviors tell the amygdala that the situation is not safe or it is only safe if we constantly monitor and stay hypervigilant. This only reinforces the idea that the anxious brain needs to remain hypervigilant in situations that scare us. You must not forget that we practice this with the attitude of self-compassion. The reason why we use the word practice is that we do not expect you to get this absolutely perfect immediately. After any situation when you are anxious, we implore you to pick out your positives and how you did and build upon that. There is no use of magnifying and amplifying the negatives. Inner dialogue learned from from our youth. A lot of how we see anxiety is influenced by beliefs that we learn as a child. For example, if I'm a child crying at a funeral because my grandpa passed away and I turn to my uncle for support, but he responds with, don't cry, be strong for your grandma. Then imagine that child might 
interpret this to mean what a child might come to understand and believe is that they shouldn't cry, that crying is bad or wrong. Perhaps this child is vulnerable around their parents, but is met with criticism and disregard. This might lead them to think that it is not okay to be upset. They might believe that it's not acceptable to have or express emotions. This contributes to an inner dialogue. We learn this inner dialogue during our youth. We derive meaning from the words and behaviors of the people around us, which develop into absorbing beliefs about ourselves. Let's take a look at a few examples. If a child walks up to their dad and tells them they're upset, but the father replies with a sharp, pull yourself together, then it might have them believing that they are weak. Perhaps this child goes to their mother and explains that explains to her that they're anxious, but she turns around and says, you're anxious? What about me? What about how I feel? This child might come to believe that it is not okay to be anxious, that other people's feelings are more important than their own. Similarly, the, these influences on their inner dialogue can be found in experiences like being bullied at school. Imagine what impact bullying might have on a child. They might absorb the belief that they aren't good enough, that they are pathetic and unworthy of respect. These beliefs can derive from action or inaction, words said and words that are not said. It is all about how we infer from them. The absence of hearing. I love you might encourage a child to absorb a similar belief as if they are told, we never wanted you. We might infer, infer from either scenario that they are not loved and are not worthy of love. Another example might be if a child comes home from school and the parents do not ask how they are. They might infer or interpret that to mean, I'm not interesting enough to take notice of. It is good to reflect on our inner dialogue and how it applies to us now. A lot of people say, that happened years ago, but we live by beliefs that are formulated at that age. The age when our brains are formed. This is why it is beneficial to discuss our inner dialogue using talking therapy, to try and understand where we have learned to talk to ourselves in this way. We can ask ourselves questions like, what am I absorbing? What am I absorbing about anxiety? Do I hold any prejudice? Prejudice? Am I prejudiced towards anxiety? Do I think it makes me weak? Am I ashamed of my anxiety? When you're feeling anxious and criticizing yourself about these feelings, it is worth asking where I have learned this from. Is this the attitude that I want to apply to my recovery from anxiety? Everyone experiences anxiety in their own way and no one is immune to it. Some people are just very good at hiding it. Anxiety is not a weakness and it is certainly not something to be ashamed of. Learning to be compassionate with yourself is essential for a lasting recovery. In conversation, Josh. Dean, how important was it for you to be nice to yourself when you were recovering? Dean. I was super, it was super important because we've got this inner critic, haven't we, that we've built up since we were a kid. Since we were told that we weren't going to be a superhero, we thought we would be when we grew up this inner critic that's always giving you that what ifs that's always telling you that you're not going to come out of an anxious response this voice is part of us so having to change the narrative was probably one of the most uncomfortable things to do because it requires you going against the inner critic doesn't it we must remember that the mind listens and the body reacts so if we think something negative the mind will continue to feel that and then the body will react in a negative way. And when I really sat with that little statement and realized how powerful it was, I started to change the language that I would use and to change the inner narrative. Josh, it's so important, isn't it? I remember what really helped me was quantifying anxiety from 1 to 10. So when I was practicing exposure or just generally kind of measuring my anxiety, I used to think about it like, oh, it's either on or it's off. I'm either anxious or I'm not. Actually, now it's like, I'm here at this place and my anxiety is at a four, but two weeks ago, it was an eight. So actually, I'm going in the right direction. And that's being kind. You're getting frustrated because you can't get there immediately because it's, because I think that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks. And that's why we've included cognitive reframing in this book because it's such a powerful tool to frame things in a positive way. Dean, 
And I think Josh, it's worth nothing that it's worth noting that a lot of people, when they start to either do your self help or therapy or whatever road they take on recovery, initially they'll get a positive response, won't they? But then, like an anxiety recovery that isn't a straight line, they'll have setbacks and relapses, and it's at that point where you really have to be kind to yourself. You really have to reinforce that you're not in the same position as you were at the start of the anxiety disorder. You've got the psychoeducation now and know what the anxious response is and you've seen the positive response to this. So that should help you and make you feel positive going forward. Josh. Absolutely.